Okay, there was a, a first um, lecture which I talked about why welding is important. And in fact, that lecture is one that I give in the, my welding course at MIT as the introductory lecturer. Um, right now, I'm going to talk about the prehistory of the welding of the American Welding Society, which means what happened before 1919. If we look at materials through the ages, this is a plot from Michael Ashby of materials that were used in ancient times, polymers and, comp and elastomers, composites, ceramics and glass, and metals. And then modern days, we have the same four classes of materials, but the types of metals are quite different. The volume fraction of metals is different, and, and so forth. Um, we can t go back and talk about these materials and how we join them together in ancient technology. And some of the oldest joining we know about is simply arrowheads, where they took different types of flint or other rock and they used um, various materials, twine or sinews, to essentially stick them, attach them to a stick. Uh, we actually have not changed that much in modern days. Uh, we still essentially use a type of twine or sometimes adhesive, and we use metal tips rather than. Um, <coughs> stone, but with, because we can sharpen them, but arrowhead technology is not necessarily all that different than it used to be in terms of joining technology. You're trying to join two different materials uh, to make a composite structure. Another type of ancient joining was the Chinese would make uh, bronze vessels, um, and in order to attach some of these wings on the side, or the tops, or the legs. They, some of these would be cast with the main vessel, but some of them would actually be cast ahead of time. And then when they would pour them into the mold, these were actually pieces that were fixed into the mold. And by fusion welding during the casting process, they would weld them to the vessel to make more elaborate things. A more sophisticated joining technology is called Etruscan granulation. In about 300 BC, the people before the Romans, the Etruscans, used to make some very elaborate jewelry. This is an earring, and it has small beads. Some of the beads are up here, some of them are in the center here, and they are actually joined together by transit liquid phase diffusion bonding. This is another piece of jewelry, and this is a close-up where they actually used um, copper alloys with these gold beads and whether it was copper arsenic or copper tin, they would actually make a diffusion bond using uh, first with soldering, essentially, and then diffusing it at temperature to make a solid diffusion bond. Um, I always tell my students that Pratt & Whitney patented this process in 1972 and gave it the name TLP, or transit liquid phase bonding, but that's because the Etruscans did not file a patent infringement. Uh, because they had been using it and selling it uh, many years before. Um, it turns out the Etruscans probably didn't develop this themselves. People believe that it actually came, goes back to the Egyptians and King T uh, Tutankhamun's dagger, which is right here, and we're going to look at the, the hilt. Here's the famous uh, image of Tutankhamun that most people know. If we look at a close-up of that da dagger handle, we find these little triangular beads. If you look at a blow up of those, you'll see that they used what people believe is the same Etruscan granulation technique. And the Egyptians had developed it before the, uh, the Etruscans. But no one's been willing to cut up the dagger to find out, to see if uh, it really is TLP bonding. Most of the bonding that people often think about or joining was forge welding. And forge welding is basically what a blacksmith would do uh, by hammering steel together. It's been going on for, for centuries, even millennia. They would take the solid state formed iron blooms and they would, the blacksmiths would heat them up and forge them to make a solid mass of iron thousands of years ago and make uh, swords and other things. Um, forge welding was still prominent in the early 1900s. This is a woodcut from a uh, book by Simonson on the history of welding that shows uh, forge welding repair uh, 
to make automobile parts in some of the early automobiles in the United States. So forge welding has been with us for a long time. This is someone making an axe, axe head by for, forge welding, um, but it's a slow, very manual, labor-intensive process. What most of us like to think of as welding is typically arc welding, and that was developed the first, not the first electric arc, but what people usually attribute the, the electric arc to Sir Humphrey Davy about 1803, and he found that he had two horizontal electrodes, and as he brought them together and pulled them apart, he would get an, uh, an arch. And this is his electric arch, and you can see the plume, the fire that came from these, and he called it an electric arc because of the arch that it formed. And most people attribute arc welding to uh, the first arc welding to Humphrey Davy, but Simonson points out that there was another person before Sir Humphrey Davy, Professor Georg Christoph Lichtenberg in 1782 wrote a letter, and he's famous for these Lichtenberg figures in, of electrostatics. Um, he wrote a letter in which he said, presently I've arranged the characters of artificial electricity in another way, which until now the only electric arc lightning could do. And you remember Ben Franklin had studied lightning as a form of electricity in the 1850s or 1750s. That is, I melted a watch spring in the blade of an English penknife in such a way that a part of the watch spring and the knife edge joined together. So clearly Lichtenberg had done arc welding uh, in 1782 before Humphrey Davy. An important thing uh, for the beginning of the American Welding Society was the ability to melt steel. In 1856, Henry Bessemer came along and taught people how to melt steel in large quantities. It took him five or 10 years to perfect the process. This is Bessemer's converter, uh, one of his early first converters. Uh, it's fairly large. Here's a doorway down here, just like modern steel vessels. And this allowed the beginning of what some people call the Iron Age, but it was really the age of steel. Um, we could now melt steel in large volumes People like Andrew Carnegie came along afterwards. Andrew Carnegie became the richest man in the world in modern times, richer than Bill Gates in constant dollars by forming U.S. Steel, basically. Another area of melting of steel, which is more directly related to the welding industry, was the discovery in 1892 of a commercial way to make acetylene. And this was James Turner Moorhead from North Carolina and Thomas L. Wilson, Moorhead is fairly famous to people in North Carolina. They have the Moorhead Planetarium, named after him. He was a businessman, and Wilson was a Canadian who was working for him, and they found that if you took calcium, um, you, you could make calcium carbide in an arc furnace. They were actually trying to make other things, synthesize other chemicals, but they showed that uh, calcium carbide plus H2O and the calcium carbide was made in an arc furnace, you could get acetylene plus calcium hydroxide and they found a new gas that was hot enough to melt steel efficiently. And they formed a company which we now know or we came to know as Union Carbide uh, and they call it Simply Great Chemistry was their, their logo. Um, uh, they basically started up in um, near Buffalo, New York, near Niagara Falls, because they needed the electrical energy for the arc furnaces to make the calcium carbide. And it turns out acetylene, or oxyacetylene torches, became the welding process, much more important than arc welding in the 1890s and early 1900s. Uh, that company, Union Carbide, because of some problems in India, the Bhopal disaster, changed their name to Praxair, which is the company we know of today but it was founded by Moorhead and Wilson. And essentially that oxyacetylene welding was used on pipeline welding. This is a portable oxyacetylene generator um, from 1911. And um, this is basically Hobart Brothers was helping people weld pipelines. And typically in those days, the pipeline welding was still horse and buggy because that's the only thing that could go into the areas, the rough areas where the pipelines were. They, the cars and trucks 
of the day needed paved roads. It turns out, um, starting in the 1880s, we have the age of electrical engineering, and this is a woodcut from France um, in 1887, where people had a bunch of laden jars, basically, and they were doing arc welding, um, electric arc welding with bare metal wires, no slag, no flux, no covered electrodes in those days. They didn't come along until about uh, 25 years later. Um, but this was electric arc welding. And we had the age of electrical engineering, which came in because of George Westinghouse and Thomas Edison. And these two men basically made electricity freely available to the world with their generators and other things. Westinghouse was a proponent of AC electricity, Edison of DC electricity, and they had big fights. And of course, we know the two companies they started. One was Westinghouse Electric, which now evolved into CBS and other things, um, but still has some roots in the nuclear power industry under other names. It's been sold to uh, Alstom and uh, whatever. Combustion engineering was part of some of that. And then the company that Thomas Edison started, which is called General Electric, was just still around today. Another early electrical engineer was um, Elihu Thompson in 1891 developed a process of electric resistance welding. And electric resistance welding and oxyacetylene welding were the two primary welding processes for metals in the 1890s and early 1900s. Elihu Thompson was a co-founder with Thomas Edison of a firm called General Electric. He also, from my point of view, was famous because for one year he was president of MIT when no one else wanted the job, and so he accepted the job. He, the first General Electric plant was in Lynn, Massachusetts, just up the road from, from MIT. Here is a picture of Edison, not Edison, but Elihu Thompson, with one of his early uh, resistance welding machines. It's just a single coil for the output secondary, and the primary is all these turns around here, and he has a little switch here to turn it on, and he could uh, essentially fuse two bars, and this became a very important process in the newly evolving automotive industry. Another important electrical engineer before the American Welding Society was a man named Comfort A. Adams, um, in 1917, um, he became head of the Emergency Fleet Corporation uh, for World War uh, I. Um, if you remember, the, one of the songs was over there, and we we're gonna, the Yanks are coming, uh, and won't be long until the, the war is over, over there. But in order to get the Yanks over there, and they had to move two million men and supplies, across the Atlantic Ocean, they needed ships. And they didn't have a good way to build ships. Uh, they were still riveting ships. And um, Comfort Adams uh, realized that if they could use arc welding to build ships, it would be much more efficient. And they did use arc welding to repair ships. And you can go to Simonson's book uh, and read about the repair of ships. And the Germans, when the, when, uh, the US declared war on Germany, uh, the German ships that were in the American ports were all scuttled and damaged. Uh, the Germans didn't want the Americans to be able to use those ships, and many of them were repaired by welding uh, to get them back in service. Comfort Adams had a distinguished career. Unfortunately, he happened to be a professor at Harvard University, um, which is a competitor. However, for three years, Harvard and MIT merged between 1914 and 1917, Comfort Adams was from Cleveland, but he worked at Harvard. He became Dean of Engineering for many years at Harvard and finally retired in 1936. But in 1914 1917, he, uh, he worked at MIT. Uh, he was head of the Emergency Fleet Corporation. Um, soon after that, he became the founder of the American Welding Society, and he later founded the Welding Research Council that we know today. So Comfort Adams founded the American Welding Society Another famous electrical engineer of the time in 1895 was John Lincoln. And John Lincoln founded a company that made electrical power supplies for arc welding. At that time, arc welding 
was still in its infancy. The, they didn't have covered electrodes until around 1910. Um, mineral coated electrodes were basically developed in Sweden at a company that's now called ESOB Corporation. Um, and the uh, cellulosic electrodes were developed in the United States. John Lincoln, of course, founded the Lincoln Electric Company, which is today one of the premier uh, largest manufacturers of welding equipment and electrodes in the world. So that was the age of electrical engineering that lasted for about 30 years from the time of Edison and Westinghouse up through these, these men who helped perfect some of the arc welding. Um, and arc welding started to take over from uh, oxyacetylene welding in the 19, or around 1920. But there was an age of necessity, and this was the Emergency Fleet Corporation that Comfort Adams headed for the U.S. government um, to build the ships. And here are some ads. The ships are coming. The United States Shipping Board, Emergency Fleet Corporation, and make every minute count for Pershing, United States Shipping Board, Emergency Fleet Corporation. And here's a man riveting ships together, a slow process. And they built a number of ships um, in this age of necessity in 1917. The Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company built this ship, the El Capitan, for $230,000 total price. You probably couldn't get a ship that size today for that price. And here, Union Ironworks in Alameda, California in 1918 built the SS Defiance. And at the time, they had this type of camouflage, which they called Dazzle. And if you had multiple ships in a convoy and a submarine periscope came up, and he couldn't, the periscope, because of the dazzle camouflage, couldn't figure out where the overlapping ships began and ended because of the dazzle camouflage. So that's the prehistory of the American Welding Society and brings us up to Comfort Adams and formation of the American Welding Society in 1919, which will be part of my lecture at AWS. Thank you.